Welcome to Engage Your Tribe, a podcast about the art and science of audience engagement. I'm Jeremy Shear, and my guest is Chris Beal, CEO at Connect and Sell. Chris, it's great to have you. Hey, Jeremy. Show. Fabulous to be here with you. Engage Your Tribe is brought to you by Tribal Knowledge Podcasting. We're a full-service B2B podcasting agency, and we help brands use podcasting as a fun and efficient way to have authentic, non-salesy conversations with buyers and decision makers you need to get to know to grow your business. You can learn more at tribknowledge.com. Now, Chris, uh, I'd love to learn a little bit about you. So tell us about your background uh, in business and about Connect and Sell. Sure. Uh, my business background actually started in the software world. It's a person who was looking for a job so my pregnant wife would be able to have a baby more economically, so to speak. And uh, I kind of switched over from my desire to, to go work in the physics world, which is, you know, I was kind of looking at some different things there, including the Tokamak lab over at UCLA. And I decided, you know, software is an easy place to go get a job. It's like Willie Sutton said about banks, you know, why do you rob banks? It's where the money is. So I went into the software world and NCR was a, I'm a programmer, analyst, support guy. And what I found was that I actually had a knack for talking to people in such a way that would cause them to buy our products, even though I wasn't the sales guy. So I kept, uh, I kept being the sort of the closer on a bunch of different deals. And I think that just persisted. I went from there, to big company to Martin Marietta and founded a software education and training group, and then just started doing startups in 1983, I think, or 1983, 84, and been doing software companies ever since, uh, building them from scratch, often as the CTO but usually finding myself doing a lot of the sales. Okay. So you've been, been doing this sort of thing for quite a while and your latest and current venture is Connect and Sell. So tell us about that company. Sure. Connect and Sell is a company that was uh, founded back in 2007. I stumbled across it in 2011. I was invited to a meeting with the CEO at the time, Sean McLaren, now executive chairman. Five minutes after meeting him, he told me what the company was doing. I asked him three questions. He answered them all in a way that was convincing to me. And I told him I'm in. And he, he asked me, well, what if I'm not hiring? And I said, Sean, it's a free country. I can work for whoever I want. You can choose to pay me or not. I recommend paying me. I've heard it stabilizes the employer employee relationship. So that's how I joined up back uh, a little more than 10 years ago. And I was ahead of products. And as they say, I don't, I don't know if this is true, but no good deed goes unpunished. So at some point, uh, they made me CEO, which is, you know, somewhere between janitor and, uh, and some other kind of job, but it's, you know, it's a, it's, it's such an interesting company. It's so different from anything else I'd seen. Cause I was in the world of software where you fed the monster, you know, we make these big systems like ERP systems and MRP systems. And this reminded me more of something that we did at Sun Microsystems. So we made a big system that actually ran their warehouse. And that doesn't sound too spectacular, but in 1988, using robots and people working together to ship a billion dollars a year out of six doors was pretty different. And what was cool was the system did something. You didn't just give it data and then ask it what happened. It did something, you know, it moved stuff around. It got stuff on trucks, you know, it, it, physical things happen. And that's what connect and sell is like, it does something. You push a button and it goes to work for you, the salesperson, and goes out and finds somebody on your list for you to talk with it, puts them on the phone with you. And to them, it's a normal phone call. And to you, you just pushed a button, sat there, pet your cat, whatever it is you wanted to do, you know, get a cup of coffee. And then bloop, this little tone in your ear pops up in your screen. You've just saved an hour of misery and you're talking to somebody that you can build trust with. So that was why I joined. I, I thought I kind of got it. I think I underestimated the value of actually you know, 10 years in, I actually think it's worth more to companies than I thought and more to the innovation economy than I thought. Very interesting. And I love that you basically in your first meeting told the CEO, you're going to hire me. Yeah. <laughs> whether you, whether you think so or yeah, not. I think I've more or less told him you just hired me and yeah, you can right. pay me or not. That's the part that you do. <laughs> That's really funny. So, um, so now if I'm hearing you right, essentially connect and sell is a technology that enables salespeople to make, uh, to do, uh, telephone marketing, telephone sales more efficiently. 
and allows them to make more calls without having to do it more manually. And so we're talking about cold calling prospects for the most part, right? Yeah, we are. I mean, you got to have a first conversation with somebody before you can have a second. I say, as they say, yeah. that's just that. And <laughs> yeah, and you know, as I'm sure you're well aware, there's a whole long conversation out there about cold calling. Some people will say cold calling is dead. There's no point in doing it. You should do these other things instead. And then a whole bunch of people will strenuously disagree and say, nope, cold calling is still an integral part of sales. I think you obviously are on the side of, no, cold calling is still very much alive and a thing. And when we spoke earlier about this, you said something about how salespeople who are doing cold calling, especially, need to use tactical empathy. That's the phrase you use to make that kind of selling work. And, and that really struck with me, tactical empathy. That's an interesting phrase. So what does that mean and how and why does it matter? Well, it's Chris Voss's term, so I'd hate to define it for him, but to me, tactical empathy is empathy that is being applied in the service of a goal. That is, you're trying to get something. Okay. Tactics are means by which we get somewhere. Strategy is deciding where we want to go. So. When you're cold calling where you want to go is generally first to get trust from the other person. And actually I learned about tactical empathy in cold calling one evening. Uh, it was a holiday dinner in San Francisco at a company called Node. My friend Fallon Fatsby, the CEO, had invited me to a party. And I am not a party guy. I know people think I'm kind of outgoing. I actually go to parties and then I just talk to one person. So the person I talked to was Chris Voss, the author of Never Split the Difference, who was sitting at our table. And I kind of uh, semi-cornered him. I mean, you don't corner FBI guys or ex-FBI guys, bad idea. But I, I asked him a simple question. I said, how long do we have to get trust in a cold call? And he said, seven seconds. And I was quite surprised. I didn't expect that quick an answer. I didn't expect it to be that definite. So I said, well, really, that's interesting because our research says eight seconds. And he said, your research is wrong. It's seven seconds. And so then I asked him, well, what do we have to do in those seven seconds? They said, oh, that's easy. Now, at this point, I thought maybe, you know, that was his third bourbon. It was not, it was only the second. And, uh, and he's a guy who doesn't lose his, his, uh, his composure. So, uh, they, uh, listen carefully and, it, and he says, it's easy. All we have to do is show the other person. We see the world through their eyes. We call it tactical empathy. And then we need to demonstrate to them that we're competent to solve a problem they have right now. And I said, wasn't well, the problem they have right now me? And he said, bingo, that's why you're in control. Mm. You have complete control in a cold call because the other party is afraid of you. You are the invisible stranger represented by the people across the river who come over to your village at night. And, you know, they're not bringing you a Bud Light. They're coming over here to change your demographics violently. And so the invisible stranger is an ancient archetype that we're all afraid of. And when we cold call someone, we are invisible and we are a stranger and we just ambushed them. So they're afraid of us. And that turns out to be the positive key to getting the only thing that you should be shooting for hundred percent of the time in cold calling, which is trust. So if you apply that that situation that you find yourself in, which is you frighten somebody, you relieve their fear through a combination of tactical empathy, uh, followed by showing them you're competent to solve the problem that is you, then they will trust you. And I asked him then, how long will they trust you? And he said, forever until you blow it. Now think about that, the competitive hmm. situation. If you could cause your entire target market to trust you as a person before they even know the other people, how much competitive advantage does that concur in B2B where trust is everything? The huge advantage for sure. So that's why we do what we do at Connect and Sell. We call it manufacturing trust in the business of, of, uh, helping companies dominate markets. I, I know it sounds like sales efficiency. I have so little interest in sales efficiency, it wouldn't fit in a thimble, but I have a lot of interest in companies in the innovation economy who have the goods and the will to dominate their markets to go out and get in that safe place of dominance because everything else is not safe. Okay. So first of all, is, is there a significant inf difference between seven seconds and eight seconds in your opinion, when it comes to what we're talking about? I have about? no idea. I'm not able to actually measure that. So I figure that okay. you know, if the FBI and Harvard business school <laughs> labs and all these guys came, 
and come up with seven seconds, I'm good. But what's interesting about it to me is it actually isn't the amount of time that's so important, although it's very important. It's the goal. The goal of cold calling normally is to get a meeting. And in this case, the meeting is gravy. The goal is to get trust. The meeting comes or doesn't come. Yeah. Okay. So how, what does this look like in practice? How, in fact, do you get trust in seven seconds or less on a cold? Well, first you throw yourself under the bus. You are a bad thing and that's tactical empathy. You're seeing the world through their eyes. You frighten them and they want to do one thing, get off this call. And they have one constraint. They want to do it with, with their self image intact. Otherwise they just hang up. I mean, let's face it. If you cold call somebody and you're a salesperson and they answer the phone, they made a mistake. They want to rectify that mistake as quickly as possible, but they don't want to become a jerk by doing that to themselves, but so mm -hmm. that's their constraint. So operating within that constraint is fairly straightforward. You say something like this, Jeremy, I know I'm an interruption. And you say it just like that hard on the no, no softening anywhere. No, like, oh, I realize I'm interrupting your day. Shall we have a cup of tea kind of thing? It's. I know I'm an interruption. You throw yourself under the bus. You know you're an interruption, but you're doing it voluntarily. You're doing it deliberately. You must have some purpose, right? I mean, otherwise I'm just calling to annoy you and that doesn't make any sense. So I know I'm an interruption. Can I have 27 seconds to tell you why I call? Now the second part, you switch your voice to what the FBI calls a playful, curious voice, the come along with me voice, and you offer a solution to the problem. That is, you listen to me for 27 seconds. I'll keep my promise. I'll tell you why I called. Then we're done. You get to achieve your goal. You get off the call with your self image intact. I get to achieve my goal, which oddly enough was to get you to trust me. Okay. And the, and the trust comes in that you've thrown yourself under the bus, like you say, sort of a disarming to disarm the other person's like fear or annoyance or both. And then how is it that they now trust you where they might not have before? Well, because you've fulfilled both of the pieces of the trust equation that Chris Voss talked about. Tactical empathy, you show them you see the world through their eyes. Okay. And you've made it clear you're competent to solve a problem they have right now. The problem is you. But that's okay. Mm -hmm. That's okay. And, and the solution is within the next 27 seconds, this will all be yes. over. All you have to do is just give me 27 seconds and I'll, and I'll, and we'll be done. And I am only going to do one thing. I'm okay. going to tell you why I call. I'm not going to sell you anything. I'm going to tell you why I call. Okay. So then you, you say why you called and the content of that. Well, what, then what do you say? What are you talking about? Well, so what we advise people to say, it's very delicate. It's kind of a high wire act at this point. So now you've got trust. Your number one goal is don't blow it. So. It's really easy to blow it by trying to sell them something because they weren't really waiting yeah. for a salesperson to call them and tell them how to do their job. Nobody's waiting for that. That's not like, oh my God, I'm so incompetent and I'm so, I, I'm so lacking in diligence. <laughs> I'm sure hoping a salesperson calls me and tells me about a category of solution to a problem that I must know that I have. That's I, no one's waiting for that call, right? It's never, it's never happened. happened. But salespeople right. act like it's happening all the time and they go for value. I'm going to, I'm going to talk about the value we've provided to others. And we help companies like X, Y, and Z solve problem A, B, C before the, you know, their world comes to an end. So instead you go a different path. You go to curiosity. So the path is from fear, their fear of the invisible stranger to trust because you did the right thing to curiosity because curiosity moves people toward doing novel things. And taking a meeting with you is a novel thing. After all, eight seconds ago, they weren't intending to take a meeting with you. Now they aren't intending to take a meeting with you, but they trust you enough to listen to you. So you need to walk a delicate path to curiosity. And we found some words and some tones that help. And that, it all has to be underlain by a belief. And that's a sincere belief in the potential value of the meeting you're offering for this human being even in the case where you're never going to do business together. You have to sincerely believe they're going to learn something of durable value. And so once you have that fixed in your head and in your heart, so to speak, you can say this. So I can say, thanks, Jeremy. Jeremy, I believe we've discovered a breakthrough. 
that completely eliminates the waste frustration that keeps your, and now I just have to say one bad thing that's keeping you from going where you want to go. So what is, what is it? Well, if you're running a sales team and you're somebody in my tribe, then you want your salespeople to use the phone and use it effectively. So I'll say, thanks, Jeremy. Jeremy, I believe we've discovered a breakthrough that completely eliminates the waste of frustration that keeps your best sales reps from being effective on the phone or even using the phone at all. And the reason I reached out to you is to get 15 minutes on your calendar to share this breakthrough with you. Now I'm done. That took 17 to 18 seconds. I got 10 more. I've already I've fulfilled my promise. I told you why I called. We're done. So I got some more time, so I'm going to use it. But now in a playful, curious voice, I'll ask a question of fact. Do you happen to have your calendar available? Same voice I used when I asked, can I have 27 seconds to tell you why I call? That is the voice is identical. So it's a come along with me voice. And now I am silent. Notice what I didn't do. I didn't tell you the category of problem I solved. And the reason is marketing language is all about placing my company's product in a category and then differentiating within the category in a way that I suspect or hope is important to my audience. But this isn't marketing. This is sales. This is about going from fear. We don't, in marketing, we don't start saying, and they start out afraid of us, right? That's not it. Mm, <laughs> the emotion right. isn't fear. The emotion is actually, the, the situation of marketing is distraction. We're trying to rise above the crowd. We're trying to overcome the perpetual distraction in the real world where people are naturally paying attention to other things, not us. And then we want to establish ourselves in marketing and category so that they can be attracted to the, to this category, to this language around it. Should they be kind of thinking about that problem or wrestling with that problem? Then we want to put our differentiators in front of them in a way that is compelling and memorable. And then we want to have a call to action of some kind so that they could choose to take a next step with us, right? But in, in a cold call, you can't do that and succeed. If you try to establish the category, you're insulting that person. You're saying they don't know how to do their job. They, they didn't mm -hmm. rise up out of their distraction and notice you, you forced yourself on. And so you have a, an interesting situation where you're not yet ready to talk about the category. You're just talking about the fact that there's a breakthrough and the breakthrough is worth learning about, not worth buying worth learning about. So that's the key to the cold call is you go from fear to trust, to curiosity, to commitment, and then you don't worry about it. If they don't show up at the meeting, Hey, you got somebody who answers the phones. So call them up and say, Hey, I see we had something on the calendar yesterday for nine o'clock. Something important must come up for you. When would be a better time to talk? And now you have a machine for generating short meetings about your breakthroughs in a trust context. So you didn't blow the trust. So we call it paving the market with trust. So you pave the entire market with trust and seven second conversations. You convert as many of those to meetings as you can, but you do it without blowing it. So you don't sell them anything. And then you nurture them with future conversations. If they didn't take the meeting and if they did take the meeting, but they didn't attend the meeting, well, then you call them politely point out something more important than that meeting must to come up. When's a better time to talk? That machine dominates moments. Very interesting. So, so what if early on in that process, you say, can I have 27 seconds to, you know, to tell you this? And they just say, no, I, I'm, I, I'm too busy right now. Then you say, fantastic. You go to your ledge. You say, fantastic, fantastic. Tell you what, um, too busy right now. I'll let you go. I'll give you a call sometime, maybe a week, maybe a month, and we'll see if you have some more time. Remember, you just try again. I found out something incredibly valuable about this person. They answer their phone. That is the single most valuable thing we can know in a world of market segmentation. We tend to segment markets in a way that has to do with what we think they need or how big they are or what, you know, whatever. It's kind of a. It's an us-based segmentation. I like to sell the big companies, therefore I'll go sell the big companies kind of thing, right? But the most important question is, can we get a conversation with them? That's the number one segmentation question. We have to segment the market between those we can get a conversation with 
a real conversation and those that we can't or that it's really hard. The only way to do it is to sample the market by talking to it. Now at Connect and Sell, it so happens we know who answers the phone because we make 60 million dials a year. So we know which of those turned into the 3 million conversations. You don't. <laughs> so we got to go explore your market. Right. And you probably actually don't know who you should be. This is actually, this is a conceit many companies have, which is, Hey, you know, we know who we should be talking about. That's really? Well, yeah, we sold to Joe and we're going to talk to people like Joe. Okay. So do you have that nailed down with statistical significance across your target? How big's your TAM? Oh, so many dollars. No, no, no. How big's the count? Well, it's, I don't know, 10,000, 10,000 companies. Okay, so we need to actually go have conversations with 100 of them, the square root of 10,000, just to get a signal back that says, hey, they're interested in this breakthrough or not. If they don't take the meetings above some threshold level, uh, we're barking up the wrong tree. Mm -hmm. So, wow, there's so much interesting here. Um, you've used the word conversations a few times, which... Um, really resonates with me because as a podcast person, to me, that's what podcasting is all about. You know, whether it's purely for entertainment or as a business communication tool, it's about having conversations with people. And you yourself are a podcaster. You have a, a, a podcast. Tell us a little bit about it and why you do it. Sort of what, what's the value for you in uh, doing this podcast? My friend, Corey Frank, that I've been doing stuff with for many years, many people think he's the greatest inside sales business leader in the world. He called me up one day, I don't know, three years ago, and he said, hey, I'm going to get a book out of you yeah, on market dominance. And I'm going to interview you every Thursday morning for an hour and a half, and we'll gather up the words and we'll publish the book. And so we started doing that, and it was horrible recording. It was like me just sitting in a big equity room in a big house in Reno, Nevada and talking to him. And it was interesting. It was an interesting process, those conversations. It brought things out of me that were more detailed, more coherent, um, more structured than I had expected. And it was exactly what he expected, but it wasn't what I expected. So at some point in that process, about four or five months into it, so we had a lot of these hours of recording, just us holding conversations. A guy named James Obermeyer, who's in the podcast business with Funnel Media, uh, Funnel Radio, who I had known vaguely from some other experience, called me up. And he said, hey, Chris, I listened to you on Daryl Frail's Inside Inside Sales podcast, and it changed your, what you said changed my view of this. Completely. He says, I have now remade my business around those principles. And I think you ought to have your own podcast. And I said, is this like something I have to do a particular day of the week? And well, he said, well, yeah. And I said, no, I ain't doing that. But I do have these horrible recordings that Corey and I have been doing. So how about if I send some over and I got Corey on the phone, we had a little three-way conversation and sent him over. And James said, look, this stuff's going to change the face of business. And he cut five episodes for me free and just sent them over. And it was weird because I mean, the production values were below dirt, right? It was like as bad as it could get, but the coherence was pretty high. And we put them out there and gave it a name, market dominance guys, because it's about market dominance and uh, kind of a, a, a homage to the car guys on national public, mm -hmm. you know, the click and clack who well, kind yeah, of yeah. panic myself. I, I used to make my living that way back in the day. And a couple of MIT guys who were, you know, being garage guys. That was like Corey and I, we kind of felt like that, like people with a different mm -hmm. kind of educational background than you tend to find in the world of inside sales. So why don't we bring that kind of background, in my case, physics, math, engineering into the world of sales and talk about it. And the, so we're at episode 120. I think podcasting is superior to every other medium I've seen for introducing your company's ideas, personality, spirit, a uh, way of looking at the world to an audience that naturally accretes around what you're doing. It's interesting because it's kind of all word of mouth. I mean, it's supposedly all this, you know, reviews and ratings and all that. But I think what really happens is people get lit up 
Like we have a guy who, uh, his name's Henry Wojtyla. He called me up one day and said, Hey, um, I was referred to you by the guys at Sandler. I went to your website, I read some blog stuff and you used a phrase amplify suck in your blog. And I figured nobody would say amplify suck about their own product unless they were serious. So I went to your podcast. My wife was on a ski trip that weekend and I binge listened to the whole thing, had it all transcribed and have made a kind of a company handbook and a procedure manual out of it. And I want to fly up to Seattle and talk to you about it. And you know, that's what podcasts can do. And I don't think anything else can do that or somebody would, you know, when, it, when you have high resonance, you have a lot of material for them to wallow in. What, what, what about the nature of podcasting do you think allows it to do that kind of thing? I think it's the conversational nature. And I think it mm. appeals to a wider audience in a fundamental way than ebooks do, because you're just hearing the author's voice than audiobooks do, where again, it's a professional reader, but it's just the same over and over. There's, you know, all conversations have tension in their by their nature. Somebody's asking questions, the, the, you know, you're wondering what's going to happen. So they all contain this, the story, you know, somebody wants something and they, the story is a conversational story. It's delivered in dialogue, not delivered in monologue or some sort of, uh, I don't know, prose, you know, so it, it's that liveliness of the human voice that we bring out naturally when we speak with each other. The other thing that's so different is say, you know, I've done some episodes of my podcast where we were short an episode for whatever reason. Right? I mean, where he's a busy guy running a company, I run a company, went down to the beach and, uh, up near our house in Port Townsend, quiet beach, thank God, and sat there in this little cupola thing and just recorded an episode. And you know, it was okay, but it wasn't a conversation. And I, I am a, shall we say above average, talk to the camera guy. I, I spent two years talking to the camera for, for two hours every morning, just me, my script and the camera, Martin Marietta producing training videos. So I'm pretty comfortable just talking to the camera mm -hmm. and still not the same. It just didn't bring out that all of the stuff in the voice, you know, the human voice is, is utterly magical to other humans and it's not the words. I think other media tend to carry the words, but podcasting carries the sounds. Now the words are like how many bits per second in the words. I mean, if I wrote them down, I can speak at uh, what a hundred and twenty words a minute or something like that. Right? So each word is say an average of say it was five, let's make it easy. We'll make it five characters long and 10 bits per character, right? So it's a hundred, let's say it's a hundred, a hundred times five times 20. What is that? That's, that's a, you know, five times 20. That's a hundred. So that's a hundred times a hundred. That's 10,000 bits a minute, right? The human voice carries 20,000 bits a second. That's 120 times more information than the words are carrying. And it's all emotion. That's so interesting. I mean, I think about this stuff all the time, again, because of the nature of what I do. And I think you make an excellent point that in the, the nature of conversation, there's something, there's drama inherent in it when two people converse. It doesn't mean they're talking about something dramatic necessarily. In, in fact, it's often not the case, but that just the exchange, there's, when, when it's a real conversation unplanned, there's something really inherently interesting about that. And I totally agree. It's not so much about exactly what the words are or even what they mean. It's the, the emotion in them yeah. and the way that our brain processes that emotion and the ups and downs in the tone of voice. And when you combine that with, if it's something that you're, the listener is actually interested in, which it usually is because why else would they be listening? in the first place, the combination of those things can be, I think, as you put it, kind of magical in a way that reading a blog post usually is not. Exactly. And for some audiences, reading is not easy, you know, and in the sales world, for instance, a fairly high proportion of salespeople are dyslexic. And while they might be able to read just fine, they overcame something in order to get there. You know, the famous example is Sir Richard Branson, famous dyslexic guy who published a magazine when he was in high school. 
That's interesting, right? That's somebody who will take on the challenges mm-hmm. of life in a different kind of way. And yeah. And yet he's still dyslexic. He doesn't, he, you don't get to wave a magic wand and make dyslexia or ADD go away. And salespeople concentrate around dyslexia and ADD. And they're the folks who learn to talk their way through life and listen their way through life, listen very carefully because they couldn't just be the one who raised their hand and had all the answers. So think about how many hours you spent in school as a child. You're told to sit, not do anything with your body or somebody with a little ADD, that's crazy, in a highly social setting full of people that you're not supposed to pay attention to. Pay no attention to anybody in this class, just the teacher who bores you silly. And then you're expected to read what they write on the white or the whatever the blackboard was back then, the whiteboard, then read a bunch of other stuff and then regurgitate it later and it's called an exam, right? Well, you better learn to talk and listen if you're going to be successful in that world, because if, if your tools don't include that reading is easy and fun and that sitting still and paying no attention to other people is your, is your happy moment, right? So that's the world that generates the great salespeople. The, as I remember telling my kids once we lived in a, a community in, uh, uh, Lafayette, Colorado, and it was a uh, we'd lived in the mountains in a log cabin and we were moving down to town and we, we chose this kind of, I don't know, it's sort of a big house actually in a, in a gated community, but not, a, it wasn't very posh. It was just a gated community. It was nice. And, uh, I remember walking around one day with my eldest and, and, uh, she asked me, well, like, how do people have enough money for these houses? I know how you do it, dad, you know, you build companies and run them and it looks crazy, but how do these people have you know, where's the money come from? I said, these are salespeople. This is where the money goes in our society. It goes to people who can listen and talk in a way that causes somebody to change from not transacting with company to transacting with them. It's the greatest sort of magic trick in business. And these are the people that can do it. And, and she asked a great question. She said, well, what's special about them? And I said, well, they talk and listen really well. And they're pretty persistent compared to most people. They'll do it even if they don't get an immediate reward. So ADV, dyslexia, yeah, that's the forge. Those are the hot fires in which many, not all, but many of the greatest salespeople are born. And that's why the cold call is so interesting. And that's why podcasting is so interesting. Both of these make sense to that kind of person. Wow. That's so interesting. I had no idea. Never heard that before, but, but what you're saying makes sense. Um, a new way to think about the value of podcasting really super fascinating. Well, Chris, I, I could easily just go on asking you questions and picking your brain, but, uh, I've kept you for more than half an hour now. I feel like I, I need to let you go. I don't want to be selfish. So, <laughs> so thank you so much for a fascinating conversation. Really enjoyed. Thanks, Jeremy. This is really fun and a great way to spend a holiday morning. Indeed.